The contents of One My Baby Back, this media, and anything created or shared by One My Baby Back LLC are opinions not to defame or make any accusations. Some names are pseudonyms. Please pardon the typos, slurred or misspoken words, and other errors. This content was created in grief. Copyright One My Baby Back LLC. All rights reserved. Day 19. The old me always put special effort into interactions with cashiers or customer service personnel. My goal was always to make them laugh. I once spent 45 minutes on the phone with a bank's customer service staff. I wouldn't end the call until I made them laugh out loud. Eventually, they did at my commentary on the sad state of my IRA balance. It's cold. Since Constance is passing, my goal seems to be the opposite. There's no need for them to wonder why I'm buying moving supplies because I'll tell them. My child is dead, and so I must move. If they are curious why my mascara is running down my face, they need not speculate because I'll just state the cause. My child is dead, and so I can't predict to control when I cry. Then, boundaries be damned, I will hug them. My exuberant, extroverted nature seems to be a gift only when I'm not treating every person I interact with like an opportunity to overshare and unload. In lieu of some amount of self-liberty, I now utilize self-checkout and online shopping, isolation over self-control. Day 20, shaking with fear, I realized I am actually going to have to move out of the house I shared with my daughter soon. I fear touching her precious things. I fear somehow diminishing her memory. I irrationally fear she won't be able to find her way back home. I believed I'd have more time. Time when the house's construction projects would be completed. Time when our house would be on the market. Time for the closing process. Time to come to terms with everything. Ultimately, I just wanted more time with my daughter. If I was in a logical frame of mind, I would see the idea of having a four-bedroom house to myself as ridiculous. Constance's father will have the house empty and listed in the next few weeks. He needs to move on with his life. I find the sentiment singularly fanciful. Moving means my plan to keep my daughter's room in museum quality preservation for the near term. It's just another dream about her future that isn't going to happen. I am moving my daughter's things into public storage. I can't be the first person to cry there. Day 21. I went to Target to get disposable dishes to replace the real ones in storage. While staring blankly at the food display, I saw a little boy walking. His father mindlessly stepped on his foot. The boy stopped walking after his dad and put the injured foot on top of the other and cried out in pain. His father didn't notice and just kept walking. Children's words are high-pitched and not clearly articulated. So it takes a trained ear to decipher them. Mesmerized, I got every word. My foot hurts. You stepped on my foot. The boy wailed and cried. His dad didn't apologize, but instead started pulling him forward towards the register while he bawled. Staring at the scene, my uncharitable thought was, why does this man deserve his child and I don't? My mind flooded with all the people I had seen behaving cruelly or thoughtlessly towards their children. Quickly, I went to my car, focused on one clear goal, getting home so I could break down and cry. When Constance was alive, I enjoyed taking her shopping with me. She would pick her favorite things to put in the cart, and I would always buy them for her. She would giggle with joy at Target. They sold us her classic lace potato chips, those frozen cheese pizzas she loved, and the gala organic apples she craved so strongly. She would become anxious with even the slightest delay in eating them. Day 22. It is predictable that my nocturnal tossing and churning would only occasionally be interrupted by frightful sleep. That's probably on page one of the Brief Parent Handbook. My nightmares tend to show Constance in horrendous, life-threatening situations in which I can't save her. The hurricane was a particularly memorable one.
Last night's experience was far crueler. In the dream, Constance was sitting on my lap, facing the same direction I was. I tightly wrapped myself around her like a shawl. While kissing the top of her head, I told her that I loved her. I love you. I love you. I love you. I told her I missed her and asked her not to leave again. I silently tried to remember why she'd been away. After several fanciful musings, I was punched in the heart with the realization that I was dreaming. I immediately grabbed her tighter in the hopes of never letting go of that feeling. I lurched awake and realized I am holding myself. I usually try to fall asleep in the same self-hug position to get the dream back. But, you know, instead I wept. (sighs) My daughter frequently chose sitting on my lap over uncomfortable surfaces such as a bench or the floor. I love the extra cuddle time with my baby girl. I'll cherish those memories. Day 23. Today I am posting and sharing the thank you note that I sent to those who donated to Cherry Preschool and my daughter's alma mater. I hope the I hope that reading the letter gives you a slight indication of who my daughter was and how hard she worked to be in this world. Her positivity and persistence continue to inspire me. Dear donor's name, thank you for honoring the memory of Constance with the charitable donation to Cherry Preschool's inclusion program. Your gift will help continue their mission of providing children with a disability with access to high quality preschool education. When Constance was 18 months old, I attempted to enroll her in our local community nursery schools, two hour, twice a week preschool program. After one day with Constance, they informed me that she was not capable of learning in a preschool environment. I called all the local preschools to ask if they took children with different needs. I worked my way all the way from Highland Park to Evanston before I found Cherry Preschool. Cherry's Child Development Inclusion Director, Rhonda, met with Constance and was confident that they could provide her with a wonderful preschool education. Rhonda was right. B, Martha, Rena, and her aide, Michaela, were all amazing. They provided all the children in our classroom with an exceptional and inclusive education. Years after Constance graduated from Cherry Preschool, I could still see Constance standing in line for the slide or interacting appropriately with another child, and I would think, thank God for Cherry Preschool. Just as critical, Ranta taught me how to be an advocate for Constance's needs, and Cherry's inclusion, in, Cherry's inclusion moms provided me the camaraderie and encouragement. At this difficult time, I continue to lean on the Cherry community for support. Your donation supports that and the continued inclusion of other children like Constance. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you again for remembering our beloved Constance. With gratitude, Rochelle. Day 24. Constance and her paternal uncle, Elmer, both had seizures. Several months before my daughter passed, Elmer had a brain tumor hemorrhage similar to the one my daughter had. It left him unable to speak or care for himself. He'll spend the rest of his life getting full-time medical care. Elmer and my daughter were on the same medication to manage their seizures. The day my daughter passed, her father told her, he, her father told me he blamed the medication for taking our daughter's life. I immediately provided a rebuttal. The medication was the most common one on the market for treating seizures. It had been successfully managing his uncle's seizures for decades as, at a much higher dosage. Wasn't it much more likely that they had the same genetic uh, causes? They both had epilepsy diagnoses. In fact, his mother had epilepsy as well. Without realizing it, I was arguing it wasn't the medication I gave her, but his genes that were the problem. If I were to analyze my behavior, I would say that I didn't want the medica- it to be the medication because he'd aggressively argued with my daughter's neurologist against her taking any medications to manage her seizures. However, the neurologist had described side effects such as itchy skin and general irritation. Those side effects seemed 
like a better consequence than a seizure that could leave her with brain damage or dead. The medication seemed like the right choice to her neurologist, her pediatrician, her developmental pediatrician, and me. However, it never sat right with her father, who is the type of person who doesn't take pain medication after surgery, just in case. In a twist, like out of a soap opera, my daughter's paternal great aunt sat behind me at my daughter's memorial service. Before the program began, she loudly complained about how hard it had been for her to worry about and care for Elmer. It got so loud that my daughter's father turned around and asked her to be quiet. She did, but after she painted a vivid image in the minds of everyone around her. Day 25. At the community hospital, at the pediatric hospital, at the funeral home, and nearly daily since my daughter's passing, people keep asking me the same question. Do you have other children? When I was asked at the community hospital, I thought they were wondering if a sibling might have had symptoms of an illness they would need to know about, something to diagnose or treat my daughter. At the pediatric hospital's emergency room, I thought they were wondering if I needed to arrange for someone to pick up my other children. When Constance collapsed, the we were on our way to the gym, so I was dressed head to toe in spandex. I presume they thought I was a stay-at-home mom. After Constance's passing, every time someone someone asks that question, I think they're trying to determine if I'm going to end my life or not. My mother assumes. My mother assures me it's unlikely the motivation of every single asker. She rephrased it as, "quote." They just think it would be easier for you to get over it if you had other children. Get over it? Yeah. I will never know if that's true. I don't have other children. No matter what, I couldn't get over it. Day 26. More than one friend has texted me saying that I shouldn't be back at work. I don't know what they think I should be doing. I get a lot of advice to, quote, take it easy or... Take some time. It takes some me time. I don't even know what that means. I used to really enjoy giving my daughter and myself pedicures or cuddling with her as we ate popcorn and bread in bed. I'm not really in the mood to do any of those things alone. If I didn't return to work now, I wouldn't have a job to return to. The reasons for this are outside the scope of this, but the point is they really need me. I know the work situation will be stressful for other people. Oddly, when you lose the only thing that really matters in your life, your child, you stop fearing loss of any kind. Maybe a 40-year institution will close under my leadership, and maybe it won't. I don't have the pride of purpose anymore. I want to be helpful as I can in my current state. Friends keep asking when they can come over to, quote, grieve with me, unquote. I don't think they realize that instead of a house full of furniture and mementos, mine is full of contractors and dust. I can't imagine how sitting on the floor crying with a friend would help. My natural impulse when I see someone crying is to comfort them. That doesn't seem like the appropriate response here. I used to be a social person. I found a photo of the contents of my purse the last time I changed primary handbags. I stared at it intensely. Uh, as if I were looking for Waldo. I tried to piece together the characteristics of the person who packed this particular group of things. I can't quite recall her. Um, in the photo, there is um, lip gloss, uh, some SBF foundation, over-the-counter painkiller, uh, a folded single, a folded hundred, a checkbook, a mascara brush, a toothbrush, floss, a couple different kinds of business cards, um, keys, a nail file, a fancy ink pen, a sharpie ink pen, um, and then some devices uh, for um, personal hygiene and marital relationships. Um, yeah, so just a gaggle of things. Oh, and it looks like a Ziploc of change. Um, yeah, so 
that's 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 what I can re- oh in tweezers that's what I can readily pick out um with the picture day 28 a month before my daughter passed away I was contacted by my foster care case manager Brenna Brenna had a potential adoptive boy for me for the purposes of this let's call him Adam Adam had some health issues at age six he'd spent his entire life in the hospital Adam's condition was described as reversible with surgery on several hospital systems websites from the Mayo Clinic to UC San Diego Health. I learned that after surgery, Adam could live a relatively normal life with the exception of a slightly modified diet. I was befuddled as to why Adam hadn't had the surgery. Brenna arranged me to speak to Adam's nurse so I could find out more about his needs. I wanted to determine whether I could provide a good home for him. After weeks of calling, I finally reached Adam's nurse, Carol, and asked Carol about his condition. Carol described it. At this point, I'd already spent weeks researching the illness, but I took down every word to ensure I didn't miss a detail. When she finished speaking, I asked why Adam Adam hadn't had the recommended surgical treatment. Carol said it was because the condition was too severe to, quote, risk making it worse by trying to correct it, unquote. Gobsmacked by her ignorance, she stunned me again by saying that she'd prefer if Adam is adopted by someone who lived closer to the hospital, so there would be continuity of care. Why nurse assistant Carol thought it would be about her preference is beyond me. After the bewildering call with Carol, I debriefed with Brenna. Brenna said Carol had a history of scaring off potential parents, and the only reason Adam hadn't had the surgery was that he hadn't had a home to recover in afterward. Brenna generously offered to arrange for both the surgery and a recovery nurse to come to my home if I adopted him. I practically had whiplash. I was getting such dramatically different information. Am I adopting? I don't know. Before I could commit, I wanted to be confident I could care for all of Adam's in addition to my daughter's needs. I also had a full-time job, which I needed to keep. Brenna said she'd set up a call with Adam's primary physician so I could get to know more about his needs and what the surgical recovery process would entail. Unfortunately, Carol reported to Adam's case manager that I was difficult and could and should be avoided. Apparently, my probing medical questions disqualified me as Adam's potential adoptive mother. His case manager told Brenna she was going to wait until she could find an adoptive family that got along better with Carol. Who this mysterious, easygoing parent would be, I don't know. The poor child had already waited in a state hospital to be adopted for six years. During that time, the state couldn't find a foster family family to house him temporarily, let alone permanently. The whole thing made me so upset. I yelled the entire story to my parents, each time getting more and more out of breath because of my exasperation. They agreed that Adam was being screwed over and there was nothing I could do about it. When Constance was a year old, I completed foster care certification with the plan to adopt a child from foster care. I thought I would have two children the old-fashioned way and adopt one through the state's foster to adopt program. I had friends who'd adopted that way, and it seemed like a wonderful thing to do for everyone. I also had several adult friends who had been adopted through various means, and they all seemed like the smartest, kindest, best people I knew. I thought many times, if Melissa's indication of what an adoptive child is like, then I want one. I postponed adopting and having a second child the old-fashioned way when I discovered Constance had need for some special support. I wanted to ensure that I could be an exceptional parent to her before I added any additional responsibilities. About a year ago, I started pushing to adopt through foster care again. The closest I got was the near miss with Adam. As a result, when Constance passed, I became childless. Day 29. I used to write short love notes on post-it notes and put them in Constance's lunch. This was to provide her with the opportunity to read as much as anything. 
At least once a week, a note would simply say, Dear Constance, thank you for being my daughter. Love, Mom. I was hell-bent on her knowing what a blessing she was to me. It would have been easy to let the frustrations I felt at navigating the healthcare system or fighting for her to have access to the community to become directed at her. I wasn't going to let that happen. I kissed, hugged, and praised her as much as she would let me. <clears throat> Constance was definitely a mama's girl. She had started refusing to go places with her father if I wasn't also going. She would happily get dressed, but she wouldn't go near the door without me. She'd even come and get me and hold my hand. If he tried to force her into the car, she would scream and cry for me. Of course, seeing her upset was troubling. It meant that, with rare exception, I had to go with them to whatever they were doing. However, it was no secret that I was delighted to be her favorite parent. With, There were obvious reasons why she preferred me. For example, I was the one who took her to all of her favorite activities. Her father had a different parenting style as well. A good demonstration of this was with her liquid medication. To cover its foul taste, I put it in flavored water for her. Then she'd taste the flavoring and happily drink it. Conversely, her father insisted on forcing her to drink the medication directly because, quote, if you make her, she'll take it without that, unquote. When I inquired why he'd want her to do something so unpleasant when he didn't have to, she said, quote, she's fine. She can drink it, unquote. I don't want to have a relationship with her. That's the battle of wills. We believed we loved and respected each other. I often worried that our close relationship might become strained as she grew older and began experiencing the challenges of being a teenager. Oh, what I wouldn't give to be able to... Oh, what I wouldn't give for her to be able to become a willful, independent teenager. Day 30. Today is my first day embarking on any social activities outside the house. With the exception of one work meeting, it is the first time since Constance passed that I'm seeing anyone I know outside of my immediate family. Constance's former preschool, Cherry Preschool, is having their annual fundraiser for children who need scholarships to attend the school and for providing aids for children in each classroom with special needs. Despite that, my daughter... Despite that my daughter has been, um, hasn't been there for a few years, I was graciously asked to be on the host committee. I was delighted to be bestowed this honor this year because we will all be celebrating Rhonda, their child development and inclusion director's retirement. It is impossible to overstate the transformational role that Rhonda Cohen played in my daughter, my, and thousands of other families' lives. Rhonda didn't just reach Rhonda didn't just teach us how to navigate the scary world of parenting a child with a developmental and or physical difference. She taught us how to advocate for our kids. She showed up to meetings with school districts organized therapist visits, helped us arrange playdates and friendships, strategized how to deal with difficult dads, and provided a shoulder to cry on, literally. The day of the memorial, I couldn't speak to anyone as I, my immediate family until Rhonda arrived. I was collapsed on a chair in the front row and couldn't bring myself to stand. I know I wouldn't have gotten out of that seat if Rhonda hadn't come, sat with me to cry, and helped me stand. Today, honoring Rhonda will propel me into leaving the cocooned cave of my house for the first time since Constance's passing. I could go on and on about how great Rhonda is, but given that I don't have a permission to share any of this, I'll just conclude by saying she's amazing and we all love her. I asked a few friends to join me for the event. One is giving me a ride there and another a ride home. Constance was a child of the village. Now that community is there for me. In life, you can, in life, you keep thinking you know what you're made of. Excuse me. In life, you keep thinking you know what you're made of. And then you go from the frying pan to the fire and you really learn. 
Copyright 1 by Baby Back LLC. All rights reserved. The author does not authorize, scan, use, buy, or upload to artificial intelligence of any kind. Any depiction or representation of this or Constance's story will be met with all available legal remedies. In the immortal words of Snoop, don't start no, won't be no.